Chapter 10 of the Book of Joshua recounts a miracle unlike any other. In the midst of a fierce battle against five Amorite kings, Joshua the champion of Israel commands the sun and moon to stop moving, and they obey him. There has been no day like it before or since, exclaims the narrator. But what exactly is the nature of this miracle? Does the story of Joshua 10 describe a coherent military campaign? And what does archaeology say about it? There's more to the story than meets the eye. Before we analyze the story of Joshua 10, let's consider a certain non-biblical story. According to several ancient authors, the Greek kingdom of Mycenae was once ruled by a king named Atreus. Atreus won the throne from his wicked brother Thyestes by making a deal with him. If the sun were to traverse the sky in the opposite direction, rising in the west and setting in the east, it would be a sign that the kingdom should belong to Atreus. Zeus then performed this very miracle, and Thyestes was banished from Mycenae. Now, Mycenae was a real kingdom, but the character of Atreus is probably fictional. No modern person has ever attempted a rational explanation of how the sun reversed its course for Atreus, or insisted that astronomers should incorporate the truth of Atreus' backward sunrise into their models of the solar system. We recognize the story as myth rather than literal history. Joshua's long day, however, has been a sticking point in the dialogue between religion and science for centuries. The story of Joshua's long day begins when King Adonizedek of Jerusalem hears how Joshua has destroyed Jericho and Ai and made peace with Gibeon. The text describes Gibeon as a large city like one of the royal cities, and all its men warriors. Fearing Israel, Adonizedek and four other kings decide to preemptively attack Gibeon. Gibeon sends a message to Joshua at Gilgal asking for aid, so Joshua gathers up the entire Israelite army and marches all the way to Gibeon overnight. At Gibeon, however, it is Yahweh who takes over the battle. He throws the Amorites into a panic, though how he does so is not explained. As the Amorites flee before the Israelite army, Yahweh chases them to far-off locations, Beth Horon, Azekah, and Makeda, and he pummels them with huge stones from heaven. The narrative leans heavily into mythic themes, with Yahweh fighting directly for Israel. The story seems straightforward, but some of the story's elements are difficult to explain. As Bible scholar Baruch Margalit points out, the description of Gibeon as a large city full of warriors is not quite consistent with the portrayal of the Gibeonites as fearful con artists in chapter 9. Furthermore, in verse 8, after Joshua has enthusiastically and without hesitation marched his troops to Gibeon, Yahweh delivers a reassuring fear not speech that suggests hesitance on Joshua's part, but that is hardly the case here. Joshua's reasons for aiding Gibeon who made a fool out of Joshua and the Israelites in the previous chapter, are also far from clear. The battle appears to last just one day in duration, but this is hard to square with the distances traveled. Gibeon is about 27 kilometers away from Gilgal and a thousand meters higher in elevation. Ancient armies that used ox carts for their supply train could travel only about 10 miles or 15 kilometers per day. Earlier in Joshua 9.17, it had taken the Israelites three days to reach Gibeon from Gilgal. Still, an overnight forced march of 30 kilometers is not impossible for a small army that leaves its supply train behind. The long march to Gibeon is just the start, however. Chasing the Amorite army back to Ezekah requires traveling another 30 kilometers or so. Makeda is possibly even farther away, though its exact location is unknown. The distances described here could not possibly be covered in a single day, especially since Joshua's army, as described in the Bible, does not appear to have had horses. We will return to this problem in a bit. Now we come to what Margalit calls the most difficult section in the entire narrative. Joshua pauses his pursuit of the Amorites and he commands the sun and moon to stand still. At this point, the narrator quotes an excerpt of poetry that is supposedly from a source called the Book of Jasher. Sun at Gibeon stands still, and moon in the valley of Ijalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until he took vengeance on the nation of his enemy. Is this not written in the Book of Jasher? 
According to the verses that follow, the sun stops in mid-heaven, and daylight is extended for an extra day. The narrator tells us it is a miracle unprecedented in history because Yahweh obeyed a human voice and fought for Israel. Joshua and all Israel then returned to Gilgal, adding dozens of kilometers more to the distance traveled that day. Aside from the astronomical marvel, this part of the story raises a number of questions. First of all, if the battle has shifted to distant Azekah and Makeda, what do Gibeon and Aijalon have to do with stopping the sun and moon? Why is the sun at Gibeon? Second, the manner in which the miracle is carried out is confusing. In the poem, Joshua addresses the sun directly, and the sun obeys. Yet verse 14 says it was Yahweh who heeded Joshua, not the sun. Third, we may ask why such a miracle is necessary in the first place. Gibeon has been saved, and Yahweh himself is destroying the fleeing Amorites with boulders from heaven. Surely there is little to be gained from disrupting the day-night cycle and inconveniencing the entire world. Furthermore, why is Joshua's command aimed at the moon as well? Lastly, the distance covered by Joshua and his army is already in excess of 70 kilometers. The return to Gilgal takes us close to 150 kilometers. This wouldn't be remotely possible even with an extra 24 hours of sunlight. To answer some of these questions, we need to examine the poem to the sun more closely. What it means for the sun and moon to stand still is not entirely clear. Many scholars, like Margolit, think the poem describes the sun and moon standing by to join Yahweh into battle. The key lies in a similar passage in Habakkuk 3. Verses 9 through 11 describe the agitation of the cosmic waters and the readiness of the sun and moon as Yahweh prepares for battle. Earth was split open with rivers, mountains saw you and heaved. Clouds poured down water, deep uttered its voice, sun lifted its hands high, moon stood in its princely station. Then Yahweh, depicted as a storm god, marches forth and tramples the enemy nations. Brightly your arrows darted, brilliantly your lightning spear. In indignation you marched on earth, in anger you trampled nations. It is also possible that the poet envisions the sun and moon going dark as they leave the sky to participate in Yahweh's battle. Such a daytime darkness motif could have been inspired by memories of solar eclipses. In fact, although Habakkuk 3.11 is defective in Hebrew, the Greek Barberini manuscript says that the sun stopped shining, a light held back the brilliance of the sun. Other scholars think that Joshua is supposed to be asserting authority over the sun and moon as Canaanite deities. J. Deuce believed that the poem was originally a curse tied to the Israelite conquest of Gibeon and Ajalon perhaps because those locations had cults for the sun and moon. A few scholars even believe that Yahweh himself was worshipped as a solar deity at Gibeon, an intriguing idea that is outside the scope of this video. Regardless, most scholars agree that the poem was originally independent from this story, especially since the book of Jasher is cited in two other Bible passages that have nothing to do with Joshua. I also tend to agree with Margulit's view that the poem is about Yahweh marshalling cosmic forces for battle and not so much about extending the daylight. Now, if you have seen my earlier videos, you should recall that many biblical stories combine multiple source documents into a patchwork text. That might be the case here as well. According to Margulit, the main story of Joshua 10 was originally not about saving Gibeon, but about conquering it, which is why its great size and the might of its warriors are emphasized. The description of Gibeon's size and soldiers justifies the need for reassurances from Yahweh before battle. Ancient Assyrian conquest reports often contain similar exhortations of encouragement from the gods, and we will soon see the importance of this connection. According to Margalit, the fearsome arrival of Yahweh would have occurred at Gibeon right at the start of battle, throwing the enemy into panic. I would note that this pattern of Yahweh defeating enemies through panic occurs in several other stories as well. At the morning watch, Yahweh, in the pillar of fire and cloud, looked down on the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into a panic and Yahweh threw Sisera and all his chariots and all his army into a panic before Barak. In summary, Margalit proposes that the compiler of Joshua mixed this holy war story of Yahweh defeating the Gibeonites with a non-miraculous conquest story involving five enemy kings. These two stories might have had nothing in common besides the geographical setting of Gibeon. The poetic fragment has been displaced and reinterpreted to depict a miraculous lengthening of the day when it originally described the arrival of Yahweh and his heavenly host that threw the enemy into a panic. 
This fits better with the fact that the poem itself describes the battle as taking place after the sun and moon are told to stand still. Thomas Dozman, in his well-known commentary, agrees that the poem has been displaced from the battle's start to its conclusion. He writes, The displacement of the poem after the battle introduces tension with the poem's content since the address to the sun and moon no longer precedes a battle. The conflict in meaning indicates that the author of Joshua is reinterpreting the poem for a different function in the narrative. Margulet's analysis of this passage is not universally accepted. Nevertheless, most scholars seem to agree, one, that Joshua 10 is a composite text, and two, that a long day was not the original context of the poem to the sun, even though the final text clearly describes a lengthening of the day. From verses 16 to 27, we are dealing mainly with the secondary story of Joshua's battle against the five kings. The defeated kings hide in a cave at Makeda, but after finding them, Joshua has them executed and hung from trees. At sunset, the bodies are thrown into the cave and the mouth is sealed up with huge stones, probably the same stones that Yahweh was throwing down from heaven. From verse 28 onward, we have what seems to be yet another conquest account welded onto the long day story. It has a very different writing style that commentators describe as analistic. There are no miracles in this passage, and the details about the cities and kings conquered by Joshua sometimes contradict the earlier verses. For example, Debir is a king in verse 3, but more correctly a city in verse 38. So in this campaign, Joshua assaults six cities, Makeda, Libna, Lachish, Eglon, Hebron, and Debir, a list that only partially overlaps the five cities of the earlier story, suggesting no direct relation to the Gibeon story. There are other indicators that this section originally stood apart from the Gibeon story. Each city's brief conquest account ends with the same formula. Joshua destroys the city and its inhabitants, just as he had done to X, where X is the name of the previous city in the list. So Debir is compared to Hebron, and Hebron to Eglon, and Eglon to Lachish, and Lachish to Libna. But the second city, Libna, is compared to Jericho, not Makeda, which should be the one mentioned here. Knauf argues that the destruction of Makeda was not originally part of this list, but has been added in order to tie this military campaign to the story of the five Amorite kings who died at Makeda. Yiga Levin adds, the fact that Libna is compared directly to Jericho shows that it was originally the first town in the list. The Archaeology of the Conquest So far, we have dealt only with the biblical text itself. However, the archaeological record regarding Joshua's conquest is quite clear. In simplest terms, it never happened. Joshua did not conquer Jericho and Ai or subjugate the Judahite heartland as depicted in the book of Joshua. Gibeon, far from being a great city like one of the royal cities, appears to have been mostly uninhabited in the Late Bronze Age, the period in which the book of Joshua is set. It was only the Iron Age, centuries later, that Gibeon became a significant city-state. Israeli historian Yigal Levin summarizes the evidence thusly. Very briefly, Jericho, Ai, Gibeon, Hebron, and Jarmuth don't even seem to have been settled during the Late Bronze Age, not to mention conquered during the Early Iron Age. Lachish and Hazor also seem problematic upon closer examination. All of the other towns mentioned have either not been conclusively identified or not been excavated. Renowned historian and archaeologist Nadav Naman believes Joshua 10 might be a variant of a story found in 2 Samuel 5 and 1 Chronicles 14 in which David takes his army to confront the Philistines in the same region, and Yahweh goes before David, smiting the Philistines from Gibeon to Gezer. Isaiah 28-21 appears to mention the same tradition. For Yahweh will rise up as on Mount Perizim, he will rage as in the valley of Gibeon. Note that David fights the Philistines at Baal Perizim just prior to the battle at Gibeon. Naaman summarizes, the description of Joshua's campaigns against the five Amorite kings is, in my opinion, a literary reflection of the historical episode of David's second battle against the Philistines near Gibeon. The five Amorite kings are reflections of the five Philistine lords, whom David defeated and pursued along the Beth Horon route. As for Joshua's campaign in the second half of chapter 10, Naaman points out the similarities to a campaign fought by the Assyrian king Sennacherib in the same region of Palestine in 701 BCE. 
Numerous fortified cities were captured and destroyed by the Assyrians, including Lachish, Libna, Eglon, and Debir. The intervention and defeat of Gezer in the Joshua story even seems to reflect the intervention of the Egyptian military during Assyria's campaign. Based on these and other similarities, Naaman says, We may conclude that Joshua's campaign to the Shephelah and the hill country of Judah in verses 29-39 is a general reflection of Sennacherib's campaign of 701 BCE. The connection between Joshua's conquest and the Assyrians may go further. K. Lawson Younger Jr., in a study of Near Eastern conquest accounts, identified striking parallels between Joshua 10 and various Assyrian inscriptions. One in particular, Sargon II's letter to the god Asher, describes how the storm god Hadad wiped out the fleeing armies of the kings of Urartu with torrential rain and stones from heaven, while the enemy leader hid in the recesses of his mountain. Several other Assyrian inscriptions describe enemy kings fleeing to mountains and caves to hide. Joshua's hanging of the five kings from trees also finds an exact parallel in how Sennacherib treated the Philistine rulers of Ekron by hanging their corpses from poles. Even the single-day victory framework imposed on the story of Joshua 10 is paralleled by the hyperbole of Assyrian inscriptions, which often describe long travel distances and the conquest of dozens of cities as being accomplished by the king in a single day. These inscriptions functioned as royal propaganda, and although the military campaigns they describe definitely happened, many of the details are clearly exaggeration. In summary, a literalistic interpretation of Joshua 10 leads to serious confusion and scientific contradictions. But while many aspects of this story are still debated by Bible scholars, we can tentatively conclude the following. 1. Joshua 10 is a combination of at least two and possibly three originally separate conquest stories. 2. The poem from the Book of Jasher was probably not meant to describe a long day. In its original context, it heralded the start of a battle rather than its conclusion as it does in Joshua 10. 3. Joshua 10 does not describe actual historical events from the ostensible time of Joshua, Rather, it appears to be based on a tradition about Gibeon and the Philistines, as well as a military campaign by Assyrian king Sennacherib. 4. Many specific story elements, the active involvement of the deity, the defeat of the enemy by stones from heaven, the retreat of the enemy to a cave, and the conclusion of a far-ranging campaign in a single day, appear to be inspired by Assyrian battle accounts. These findings give us a new approach to understanding when and why Joshua was written. In an article about the reception history of Joshua 10, Dutch Bible scholar Edward Nort asks, What is the intention and achievement of such a story where an originally local conflict grows mythically into a cosmic drama? According to Nort, the purpose of the conquest stories in Joshua is to depict Israel as becoming a tabula rasa, a clean slate to be the space where the Torah is lived out by God's chosen people. The stories may contain cosmic miracles and genocidal horrors, but the text is not teaching cosmology or genocide. The role of academic study should be to interpret these texts as artifacts of culture and history. The problem comes, Nort says, when texts are given a claim to validity in the present as a basis for faith and community life. Since the Middle Ages, the stories of the Bible have been used to validate wars, colonization, and slavery. They have also influenced the scientific debate on cosmology. So when the astronomer Nicholas Copernicus published De Revolutionibus in the 16th century, proposing that the planets revolved around the sun and not the sun and planets around the earth, Joshua 10 suddenly became a problem for theologians. The biblical story was regarded as a historical fact that could only be possible if the sun orbited the earth contrary to the heliocentric model. Some Protestant intellectuals like Martin Luther and John Calvin rejected Copernicus's theory and it took more than a century for heliocentrism to be fully accepted by mainstream theologians. The 20th century and the modern creationist movement ushered in a new wave of pseudoscience in defense of Joshua 10. Unsourced claims about corroboration of a long day by the Chinese and Incas, or the discovery of a missing day by astronomers have circulated since at least the 1920s, thanks to Presbyterian minister Harry Rimmer in particular. In 1950, the publication of Worlds in Collision by Emanuel Velikovsky provided new grist for the apologetics mill. In this widely derided work of pseudoscience, 
Velikovsky claimed that the planets Venus and Mars had passed near Earth in the 15th and 8th centuries BCE, causing widespread natural disasters. This conjecture was based on his treatment of ancient myths and religions as reliable historical reports of such cataclysms. Joshua's long day was cited as evidence that a comet could interrupt Earth's rotation and cause destructive meteor showers. Velikovsky's ideas were taken up by creationist Donald Patton as proof of the Bible's historical accuracy and soon found their way into the writings of other apologists, such as evangelical author Chuck Missler. Other apologists have taken a very different approach, denying that the biblical story even describes the sun stopping. One common proposal is that atmospheric refraction made the sunlight visible for longer. British astronomer E. Walter Maunder, writing in 1908, argued that Joshua actually wanted relief from the hot midday sun, so God sent storm clouds to refresh the Israelites. The day only seemed long because of how far they were able to march thanks to the cool weather. More recently, Professor John Walton of Wheaton College has argued that there was no miracle at all. The Amorites simply took the positions of the sun and moon as a bad omen that damaged their morale on the battlefield. One thing that defenders of biblical inerrancy do have in common, however, is a failure to deal with the story's archaeological background and its numerous textual problems. Unlike the tale of Atreus and the sun rising in the west, Joshua's long day has implications for Christianity, and theologians are expected to find some way of reconciling biblical tales with science. Nort says the task of biblical criticism is to destroy the certitude that allows biblical texts to be used for religious violence and the suppression of science. Thankfully, modern archaeology and higher criticism have given us much more helpful approaches to understanding the story of Joshua's long day and why it was written, even if some of the details remain uncertain.